Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the latest in Rusi's adversarial studies seminar series, in which we seek to examine how the Western way of warfare will be challenged in the 21st century by evolving competitor tactics, operational approaches, and strategies. I'm Siddharth Koshal. I'm a fellow here at the military sciences team at Rusi, and today it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Anthony King of Warwick University, will be speaking to us about the 21st century urban operating environment. Um, you know, it's been a couple of millennia since Sun Tzu said the worst thing a general could do was assault a fortification or an urban node, and he'd have probably been met with a chorus of approval by the German soldiers who fought the Rattenkrieg of Stalingrad, or indeed many a modern British and American officer coming out of Iraq or of, uh, out of uh, battle spaces like Iraq. And yet, as much as we may be wedded to the idea of maneuver, what if fighting long, grinding, positional sieges is simply not a choice, but a necessity? What does that mean for our concepts of operations and approaches to warfare? Uh, here, here today to lay out the thesis from his fascinating book on the subject uh, is Professor King, who will be speaking to us about how a series of interrelated uh, changes, both demographic, economic, and military, may make the 21st uh, century urban operating environment both unavoidable and perhaps even more complex than its predecessors were. Uh, Professor King currently holds the chair in war studies at Warwick University. He's a widely published author having written on subjects ranging from cohesion to small unit tactics and divisional command, as well as most recently on the subject of urban warfare. Uh, in addition to his academic work, he's served in a number of roles as an advisor and mentor to the British military. Uh, so first of all, Tony, thank you very much for being with us today. It's really a pleasure to have you. Um, a couple of ground rules from me before we turn over to our speaker. Uh, firstly, when we do get to the Q&A session, uh, could you please uh, put your questions to me uh, using the chat function uh, uh, while keeping your uh, microphone and camera off just to, um, to manage things? Secondly, I'd point out that both the Q&A session and the initial remarks by the speaker will be on the record and recorded. All questions that you ask will be put to the speaker anonymously unless otherwise requested. Uh, so with that having been said, uh, Tony, over to you. Okay, I'm I'm hopefully unmuted. Can I just check that uh, everyone can hear me? Hopefully, uh, people can hear me. Um, okay, yep. well, well, yeah, that's great. That 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 thanks, thanks, Siddharth. That's that's very kind and very kind and generous introduction. And uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, uh, contribute to and and engage with Rusi. And I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, well, uh, as Siddharth said, uh, we're going to have a, a session of about an hour. I, I've been asked to give a little brief brief introduction about 15 minutes into my thoughts really as kind of synopsis of the book I've just published and then hopefully we can have 45 minutes uh, discussion so with that what I will do I've got a I've got a very simple just because um, you know to try and bridge the virtual divide a little with a bit more color a bit more vividly I, I, I've got a couple of slides just to illustrate what I'm about to say uh, but as I say it's it's just general synopsis of the uh, of the uh, book, so here we go. I'll just uh, uh, start here, and you should be able to see a slide. Um, so, as I say, what I what I'd like to do is just give you about three four slides, just discussing the central uh, themes of the book. Well, where did the book come from? Where did my interest, uh, as, as I said, in terms of urban operations? Well, if we look at um, military operations warfare in the twenty first century. Uh, it seems pretty clear, and most um, scholars and most practitioners uh, have observed, and in many cases been dismayed by a migration of conflict and uh, warfare into urban areas. And certainly, if we look at the last 20 years, uh, the most intense and longest battles have taken uh, place inside urban areas rather than in the field. So in uh, notwithstanding Stalingrad and other major uh, battles uh, in stark contrast to the uh, 20th century. There's been an urbanization of conflict and an urbanization of warfare. Now, the question is, why has this taken place? Why uh, has the urban uh, environment become what seems to be the predominant uh, environment in which military forces uh, might operate? Well, 
if you look at the literature and if you look at military doctrine, contemporary uh, military doctrine, the answer is very clear. And there are two key answers that you will find ubiquitously in the uh, literature. And I might say I agree entirely with these uh, two answers. Uh, and the first is demography. Uh, so if you look at 1960, there was about 3.5 billion humans on the planet and 0.5 of them, uh, 0.5 billion of them lived in cities. Well, tw the, the latest figures from 2020 were there's 7 billion of us on the planet and 3.5 billion of us lived in uh, urban areas. Uh, so there has been an extraordinary uh, demographic explosion, an extraordinary demographic transformation in the last 50 years where um, the human population has not only uh, multiplied in size, uh, 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 you know, doubled in size, uh, but it's also uh, become a, a, a heavily urban, uh, we've become an urban animal, essentially. Uh, and as a result of this, um, this urban urbanization of the human population, population this demographic uh, transformation. Uh, most scholars and military practitioners uh, argue that warfare must necessarily move to urban areas. Urban areas have become so big, they're difficult to avoid. Um, they're also the sites typically of immiseration and disenfranchisement. So conflict emerges primarily in the urban uh, domain, especially the implication is in the global south. And therefore, uh, and on top of that, they're the centres of political economic life. So uh, the argument is that demographically, uh, the city becomes the prime operating environment of the early 21st century. Now, Related to this, and the second reason that's given is one of asymmetry, uh, that not only is the uh, is there been this urban explosion, uh, but the urban environment op uh, provides uh, opponents, especially opponents of advanced state forces, opponents of uh, advanced Western states, uh, the urban environment provides the perfect uh, environment in which to evade uh, state uh, militaries and their advanced technology. Now, I, I accept these arguments uh, uh, absolutely. I think they're completely coherent, uh, necessary conditions uh, for explaining the rise of urban warfare. But I would actually add a third and emphasize a third. Uh, and, and the third explanation is this. If you look at the last 20 years, and indeed you can trace this, this, this transition back uh, uh, further, certainly to the 1970s, um, what we see in the West, and actually it is matched in many other parts of the world, not all parts of the world, but many other parts of the world, is a very significant contraction in the size of military forces. Um, so armies uh, in particular, armies obviously in terms of thinking about urban, uh, it's a land environment, land domain. So armies have become, and the armed forces have shrunk in size and shrunk in size very dramatically. I mean, on average, Western armed forces have shrunk by, by, by about uh, a half or a third of their size since the end of the Cold War. And that shrinking uh, is continuing. And, and it's not offset by certain, there have been certain increases, uh, it, you know, returns to limited uh, conscription in, in Sweden, for instance, Poland slightly increased its force. But, but those increases don't offset the general global trend towards reduced forces. Why is this important in terms of urban? I'd say it's important for two reasons. Firstly, in stark contrast to the 20th century, uh, the armed forces, armies are no longer big enough to form the fronts that can, can uh, that uh, characterize 20th century high intensity state warfare. And precisely because armies are no longer large enough to form fronts, they no longer typically converge in the field where the great battles of the 20th century took place, but rather they converge on decisive locations in an operating theatre. And where are those decisive locations, those decisive tactical and operational and indeed strategic locations uh, are located? Uh, they're located in urban, urban areas overwhelmingly. So downsize opposing forces tend to converge on urban areas where the decisive key terrain is. And we might say in insurgency operations, similarly in the 20th century, state forces were so large, they typically threw um, 
insurgent organizations out of cities or made cities impossible to operate in for insurgent organizations till till the very ends of campaigns if they were going to lose them so either way um what we see what i would emphasize is that amplifying the effects of the increased size of cities and their demo, uh, their asymmetric advantages um the reduction the mere the sheer contraction in the size of military forces has played a very significant role in uh, 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 prioritizing the urban domain as the primary land land environment uh, for uh, for uh, military operations now here we come to a, to a second point where I want to move on to the next slide which is it's not just the contraction of armed forces have um made urban operations more likely in my view they've also altered the characteristics of urban operations they've actually that contraction of size has altered the topography of urban operations and particularly of the sort of high intensity urban battle the actual character of that operation the character of that battle is changed so let me try and um uh, try and uh, talk talk through this uh, with a little bit more detail i mean there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about whether urban operations are new or whether they are old and you will find a split in the literature between those who argue that nothing has changed and that everything you see in mosul or fallujah or aleppo uh, you could have seen in the in the ancient world that uh, the the, the uh, battle for mosul in 2016 to 2017 uh, was no different from the sack of nineveh uh, in the 7th century there's no there's no difference essentially between them and on the other hand you have other uh, uh, uh proponents who argue that actually urban operations in the contemporary environment are absolutely different or radically different i mean i i i on these questions of difference or 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 oldness traditionalism or novelty uh, i refer back to this point about the reduction of size i think there are continuities in urban warfare um but i think that urban warfare because of these these factors the increase in um uh, the size of cities the changing kinds of weaponry and the opportunities for asymmetry and crucially the reduction of forces has created a very distinctive kind of urban battle so what we see um is is a distinctive kind of urban battle very much um informed by the reduction of state uh, forces now the question then is okay um if we're looking at a a distinct kind of operation a distinct kind of battle what it what is distinct about the 21st century urban battle well in contradistinction to quite a lot of literature um i would argue it's characterized uh, by the siege and various other commentators have have argued something uh, uh, some uh, along these lines now if you look at this map of mosul so this is a map of the battle of mosul from october 2016 to its culmination in july 2017 and if you look at the lines of uh, of the iraqi army divisions as they uh, moved into the city it looks like what we see here is classic uh, maneuver uh warfare and uh, and and you know at the at the at over 9 months uh, one could take that impression but in fact if you look at the battle of mosul it's characterized quite differently um it was characterized by grinding attritional siege warfare uh, where the iraqi army had to um breach uh, clear and secure urban uh, objectives sequentially very slowly very cautiously very deliberately in a series of deliberate deliberate operation a series of deliberate bite and hold operations which actually had quite a significant similarity with um uh, uh warfare on the western front from about 1916 1917 uh, uh, now the one time iraqi army tried not to do uh attritional bite and hold operations they had an utter disaster so in december 2016 um they uh, an iraqi army force uh, sort of sprinted forward for a couple of kilometers and took the al salam hospital in east uh, 
uh, in East Mosul. Well, the result is that the, the terrain behind was re-infiltrated uh, by ISIS fighters, some of whom they hadn't even cleared uh, from the buildings through which they maneuvered or around which they maneuvered. And the result is about 100 Iraqi soldiers were, um, were surrounded. Many of them uh, were killed or wounded uh, and they lost 20 vehicles. So what these, the, the incident shows is that um, actually the urban battle is characterized in stark contrast to the preferences of 20th century warfare, not by maneuver, but by slow siege warfare, attritional siege warfare. Now we might say something a little bit more about that, that the sea, you know, siege warfare is not novel. You could look at Stalingrad and say, well, there was a siege, a kind of siege that happened uh, from September 1942 to about November uh, 1942 before uh, Operation Uranus ensured that um, uh, the German forces were surrounded. Um, but what I'd suggest is the contraction of military forces gives a very distinctive character to the contemporary siege. We do not typically get sieges in which the whole city is enveloped and completely circumvallated uh, by an opposing force force and besieged in, a, in an absolute way where actually people are actually starved out in a traditional uh, medieval or ancient manner. The sieges have a very strange character, I think, in the 21st century, which is they take place inside the city and they take place over specific locations. So you see the rise of something which I called um, the inner urban micro siege. I mean, perhaps complicated terminology. But what I mean by that term is that forces congregate onto decisive uh, tactical and operational objectives inside the city, and they fight very intensely. They engage in a very intense attritional fight for those positions, and then one or other of those sides loses, and or one of the other sides wins, takes that position, and moves on to the next position. So the urban battle assumes a very interesting dynamic, a very interesting topography of a series of inner urban sieges over decisive terrain, decisive buildings, uh, decisive uh, in pieces of infrastructure, uh, decisive neighborhoods. Uh, they're fought for very intensely, and then the battle uh, moves on. And effectively, uh, what you get is this sort of rolling series of inner urban sieges until essentially one or other force have taken back uh, the, whole, uh, the whole city. Um, and the interesting thing here is in stark contrast to the 20th century and, and, and previous uh, eras of history, is that the armed forces no longer envelop cities. On the contrary, once they start to engage in military operations in urban areas, the urban area, the city envelops them. They are actually enveloped by these huge and growing urban areas. So, Characteristic number one of the urban operation of the 21st century is a localized inner urban siege, a very intense attritional fight. But there's a second element, which is kind of paradoxical and contrary to this process of localization. Simultaneously, as the fighting concentrates into discrete areas, it simultaneously disperses and disseminates out across a global urban archipelago. Um, so that even while combatants are fighting for buildings and streets in a particular city, simultaneously that battle is resonating out across uh, the urban network, across diaspora in the urban network, and that, that, that resonance, that network is global in scale. And let me just give you one example uh, to try and show this odd dual geography uh, of the urban battle today. If we look at the Battle of Marawi um, from July uh, 2017 uh, to October 2017, uh, this was a very interesting battle where an ISIS affiliated group, Abu Sayyaf, took over uh, central areas of Marari, the, um, uh, the, one of the main cities on uh, the island of Mindanao, um, took large numbers of uh, civilians hostages, uh, forcing uh, the Filipino state uh, to basically have to retake the city um, uh, with all the potential losses that, uh, of credibility, et cetera, that that would cause. Now, why did Abu Sayyaf do this? Why did they mount this operation? Well, it was deliberately 
in reaction to the collapse of the caliphate or the imminent collapse of the ISIS caliphate uh, in the Middle East, in Iraq and in Syria. Raqqa was about to fall and would fall on the same day, in fact, as uh, the Marawi battle ended. And ISIS and ISIS's affiliate deliberately connected the caliphate in the Middle East, in, in Iraq and Syria, as I said, with this uh, insurgent uprising on, in Marawi uh, in the Philippines. So that across the global archipelago, two cities, two fights, totally separated, separated by some uh, five, 6,000 miles, were actually intimately connected in the informational uh, domain. So what we see is a very strange, complicated, uh, but fascinating uh, topography of the urban battle. Uh, no longer lineal lines of battle that characterized the 21st century, bisecting cities, huge fronts bisecting cities, um, but rather localized sieges inside the city linked to global um, uh, networks, global uh, diaspora across uh, the urban environment across uh, the world. Let me just finish with one last point, uh, the future of the ur urban warfare. Now, if we look at contemporary literature, uh, there's, there's, there's significant argument about what's going to happen in the future, and particularly are the combination of AI, um, robotics, autonomous and remote systems going to essentially change the urban battle? Are they going to essentially replace humans? And either you can either have a have a sort of idealistic utopian view that this will solve the urban problem because humans won't be fighting each other or at least armed forces won't be fighting each other or you can take the dystopian view that this represents sort of nightmare um terminate terminator-esque vision of the future i'd say both these you know the both the utopian and dis dys dystopian visions are false I think absolutely um, we're likely to see the introduction of more remote and autonomous systems in the next 10 years. However, what I put it to you uh, is that uh, these remote and autonomous systems will only augment the contracting military forces that are inside cities. And my own prediction, my own interpretation is they're only likely to um, accentuate uh, the siege conditions, the strange globalized siege conditions uh, that we've seen in the last 20 years. Uh, why, why do I think partly, uh, why do I think it's like to accentuate? Well, because uh, it's not just Western forces that will have this technology to hand. Uh, Non-Western forces, non-state forces are increasingly uh, fielding this kind of technology. Uh, so I think that mutually uh, uh, the use, the utilization of this technology will actually accentuate and amplify the kind of slow attritional siege conditions uh, that we've actually seen in the last 20 years. Now I'll stop there and happy to take uh, questions, but thanks for listening. Well, thank you very much for that, Anthony. That's, you know, really fascinating brief. We covered a lot of ground there and the questions are already coming in. So the first question we've got is about uh, the civilian impact of urban warfare. Do you think it's possible to minimize the civilian impact of urban warfare or does the future look a bit more like Grozny? And what does that mean for militaries that aren't willing to engage in that kind of fighting? Oh, well, that, look, this is this is a really important question. Um, and it's one that um, this, uh, uh, certain uh, NGOs and IGOs are dealing with with some, you know, with some some deep concern. So, uh, for instance, um, ICRC, Save the Children, are de dealing with these questions with with um, with great concern. And to be honest, with more expertise than I have, I mean, you know, optimally, what will we say? Oh, yes, civilians must and should be protected. And it must be said that up to now, although obviously they've been subjected to huge numbers of criticism, Western forces generally have been quite have been capable of um, of enacting a precise and proportional form of warfare. Um, uh, but even then, if you look at the Battle of Mosul, I mean, the figures of civilian casualties are absolutely horrifying in the Battle of Mosul. Um, the lowest that I've seen is 3,000. The highest is 25,000. I, I, people I respect have said any figure in between. Um, so let's, let's say here, 
okay, so 10,000 civilians died in the Battle of Mosul. Well, not all of them, by any stretch of the imagination, were killed by Allied air power, uh, by coalition air power and coalition artillery. And, and the ISIS were responsible for large numbers of those deaths, not least uh, through, you know, through outright murder or for, through using civilians as suicide. Um, you know, they would bind them up and put them in buildings with suicide vests on to, to exploding them when uh, Iraqi forces came into certain buildings or using them deliberately as human shields. So uh, not by any of the means, any, uh, all of them were, were um, the victim of um, coalition firepower, but a lot of them were. So the prospects, I think, are quite bleak. Um, once you move up to, you, you know, when the, when the operation is discretionary, when essentially a state force is obviously going to win it, um, including Western state forces, it's really easy or it's easier to be proportionate and precise in the application of, of violence and firepower. The minute the contest becomes more, uh, more, more uncertain and where the political stakes are, are raised in particular, well, then we start to move into terrain that looks very ancient. And I mean, if we look at, you know, what uh, the Assad regime did, did to most of um, uh, their own, most of Assad's own cities that he took back from non-regime elements. Um, I mean, you know, civilians, we know civilians were deliberately targeted. Hospitals were deliberately targeted. Civilian targets were, you know, civilian buildings were deliberately targeted in order to have an effect on the civilian population and to intimidate them, to leverage them, um, to convince them that they couldn't win. So, I mean, I've got to say, I think it's a great question, an important question, but I, I'm quite pessimistic um about the prospects and i can understand then the next thing is well no no western general is going to be want want to do it totally agreed or no western political leader is going to want to do it yeah but you know funny old thing urban warfare you know it, it may be interested in you even if you're not particularly interested in it, it so so my views on it are you know, notwithstanding the great work that organisations like Save the Children or ICRC have done, I, I'm pretty pessimistic uh, uh, about how how care, how the civilian population can be cared for. I would hope for it, but I, I, I'm pessimistic, I'm afraid. Yeah. And I suppose just as a sort of two finger to that question, you know, going back to ancient tactics, you know, people like the Mongols raising cities, because actually... It's the only way to avoid a siege to make the prospect of resistance so scary. We've seen that a bit in IS, you know, published uh, text of atrocities to Iraqi soldiers, the Taliban avoiding, you know, urban warfare by, or basically making a combination of threats and promises to, to um, Afghan soldiers and officials. Does this sort of deliberate use of terror almost become a necessity if ethical qualms are set to one side for small forces when they face the prospect of a siege, do you think? Well, uh, I, I mean, what I would say here is that it's it can be very handy. Um, so I, as you probably know, I'm definitely not of the school of thought of cognitive manoeuvre, informational manoeuvre, all that kind of stuff. And somehow battles can be won cognitively. Um, you know, I do take a Clausewitzian view of these things. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, the informational leverage um, which an urban area uh, uh, gives you, precisely because the civilian population will, will now vastly outnumber the military forces. So if you can persuade the civilians, um, you can have military effects without actually using your weapons. And, you know, you've given the absolutely brilliant example of ISIS. I completely agree. Um, you know, their, take, their, their, their taking of Mosul in 2014 was extraordinary. Now, you know, we would deplore the way they did it. Namely, they posted loads of videos with their their, their Clash of the Swords series where they were actually posting effectively snuff videos of large numbers of Shias being murdered in brutal ways by them. But absolutely, um, I mean, the urban environment, precisely because it's not just a military environment, or indeed, it's the military bit, even in fighting, is, is one aspect on it. it. It opens up this potential for a leveraging of propaganda, information operations, psychological operations, subversion, which is, you know, is heightened in my view in the 21st century. And, and, and certainly I wouldn't suggest, oh, every single city a force needs to take or a Western force needs to take has to be taken by force. 
Um, absolutely. Um, the, the, there are there are uh, there are um, propagandistic methods. But of course, note, I'd come back to my point is, yes, but propaganda doesn't work unless people actually believe you can do what you're claiming that you can do. Um, you know, propaganda of the deed is propaganda of the deed, not propaganda of I'm claiming I might be able to do this at some side in the future. So so that, that would be that would be my my, my, my point is that you, it is possible. But interestingly, even so, fighting has tended to distill down into horrible inner urban sieges. Um, so it's worth thinking, I think, seriously about that. Yeah. So we've got another question about coming in about the scale of the city. Now, how do you see the advent of the multi-million citizen megacity sort of uh, impacting these trends you've described? Do you see it accentuating them in... It's, this is this is another this is another great question where there's been an awful lot of debate in the literature about it. Um, I mean, certainly the increasing size of cities is a really important role. I totally accept that the de demography, you know, without cities, there can't be urban warfare. So there must be cities. And I totally accept the fundamental point, the bigger the cities, the more likely there is to be uh, urban warfare. Uh, and therefore, I accept that as you move to multi million cities, it increases the chance. I, t I totally accept that. Whether, um, uh, what I'd say is whether, whether it changes, you know, whether you fight, especially in mega cities, whether that fundamentally changes the dynamics. I personally don't think so. Um, I think that, you know, once you've got a city over, you know, a pretty large city, uh, I mean, it could be less than a million, Fallujah was less than a million, but once you get a city over a million or so, it's, it's big enough to deal with and the problems I think will be replicated. The megacity question is an interesting one. Um, I, I, I'm sceptical about this. I mean, really good commentator Michael Evans, uh, used to be a British officer, but now works in Australia, has argued that most city, you know, megacities have increased, but actually still most, most urban areas are between one and, and, and five million. And, and so he doesn't think that megacities work. And I agree with that. But I actually, my point would be this, that if you're looking for Western forces, Look at the theatres in which Western forces are likely to operate. Um, well, there's only one theatre in which Western forces are likely to operate on the land in a sort of high intensity environment, and that's Korea. And ironically there, precisely because force density is so high, I actually think, at least in the initial phases of any God forbid conflict out there, that mega city war in, in on the Korean Peninsula is not at all a certainty, even though Seoul is only 50, 60 miles away from the, uh, the south of the DMZ. So I, I think the increasing scale of cities absolutely makes it more likely. Um, but I think it amplifies only this point about um, about the nature of an urban clearance operation, that they, they really do assume this enveloped inner urban characteristic that I've tried to describe. Right. So just to pick up on that point about Korea, which I think is really fascinating, uh, you know, you mentioned that the city in many ways is a great hiding ground for an outgunned force. Well, the North Koreans, of course, have used a different way to hide, right? The tunnel networks in the mountains, so in a way similar to what the Japanese did on Okinawa or Iwo Jima. I wonder how much of the thesis perhaps is one area of pushback might be is overdetermined by the fact we've looked at the Middle East, which is generally sort of flat and featureless. And so the only place you can hide is the city if you're the weaker force. Does does the argument translate elsewhere as easily onto other terrain? Yeah, I think this is a really good methodological <laughs> issue, and 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 certainly bears bears out. You know, bears out some. You know, I mean, I think there is some empirical evidence of that. Is that you've got cities. You know, crudely, if we're talking crude geographic terms, as you said, Middle East is a arid area punctuated by cities. That arid area often is quite it is pretty easy to surveil especially with air surveillance drones etc so i think that i think that might i think that might be uh, might be the case um but I, but i actually I, I would actually still say um, the and this is where the numbers thing becomes important um that look field fortifications can be utterly brilliant um and note that field fortifications for me they they are the absolutely logical um, solution in Korea. Why? Because the peninsula is only 80 miles across where the DMZ is. And the, the um, uh, Republic of Korea have 400,000 troops in that area. So you can create a field defensive system 
which you can absolutely definitely know is covering your strategic vulnerabilities, namely Seoul. But if you take that to a different area, even one that's not the Middle East, so let's take an example of uh, Northern Europe, the Baltics, and there, um, could you create a, a field, a system of field fortification of the equivalent that's now on the, the DMZ in southern uh, Korea, or is like a Maginot uh, fort, uh, a, a, a Maginot line, namely a field fortification which is not only robust to artillery and air, air, air power, there's no question one could create such a system very easily, but could you create a system with the number of forces that you have that would cover your strategic vulnerabilities, namely your cities and your road infrastructure. And there, I think the answer would be mm, much less likely. And then you get into exactly the calculus the early medieval military commanders and political malias made, which is the best way to defend their strategic vulnerabilities, given the very small size of armies that they had, was not to try and engage in some massive field fortifications, which in fact only came in much later. It's to actually create citadels, a system of citadels and fortresses on the borders of your terrain, in which small, very small, you know, historically very small um, concentrations of troops, garrisons were kept. And for me, therefore, um, you know, notwithstanding, I think your your point about the the ecology of the Middle East and Near East is, is is very well put. I think actually the problem, once you take the numbers issue seriously, the force numbers issue is seriously, there's a strategic problem that actually pertains in almost every theater that is not dependent upon the geography. For instance, even think about a theater like Sweden or the high north. So NATO's thinking seriously about the high north. Well, you could put some Royal Marines and, on, on some coal up in the Lingen Peninsula or around up now near Tromso, uh, and that, that might have the effect. Or, and, and this is a question, is it not better to stick them in Tromso itself in a citadel in Tromso? as a garrison in Tromso and actually work the theatre, which is the most remote theatre that one could think of, and work the theatre, defend the theatre from a series of citadels, as in fact, well, certainly in Sweden, as in fact, Swedish kings used to do in the early modern period. Um, so, so, so that, you, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you and, and ecological, geographic, regional sensitivity is required. But there is a military, the reduction of military forces sets a strategic problem, which I think a, a, a kind of pretty quick solution is the traditional one of you build cities, you build fortresses, you build citadels, and you defend your territory from inside those citadels or from the network of citadels that you create. And that's that's where that's where I would, you know, as a non-military observer, that's where I would put my money personally. Yeah, and it's an it's a really fascinating point when you mention you know, the Russian example in a situation where you are at gunned on the ground, the best military solution, the citadel, also requires something quite politically risky, which is the possibility the Russians will turn a major city into Grozny, isn't it? Well, for sure. Though, of course, the informational potential of that is also could be exploited the other way. So, yeah. a note. Note the ridiculous but outrageous um, siege of Dubrovnik uh, by uh, the Serbs in the um, in, in the Bosnian and Croatian war. You know the sort of duel that's and I mean it was a complete. I mean what, whoever sanctioned it needs to be probably sectioned. I mean it, it was the most crazy thing um, that you would you would you would bomb a world heritage site and therefore evaporate what limited um, credibility you had with the international community. So it's not that I'm suggesting, oh yes, um, let's, let's like ISIS turn our, uh, our citizens into, into uh, shields, but note, yeah, you know, the, uh, the point of a war is to defend those citizens from, a, um, uh, uh, from, from, from an aggressor, from aggressive state. If you lose the war, you have failed in that mission and as I say, uh, an aggressive state attacking your civilians, 
uh, can be informationally um, useful, even if it presents you with a hideous thing that you don't want to happen. I mean, once you're in, once you're in a war, whether if you were talking about the high north, if you deployed raw marines and their mountain and Arctic colleagues up into the mountains of Lingen and various other Hardanger Pato, it wouldn't stop Russia from bombing the cities anyway. So um, I think there's some pretty harsh calculuses to be taken, I suspect, in the next 10, uh, 10 15 uh, years. Uh, but, but I also take the point, politically, this comes back to that early excellent question. Um, yes, um, you know, warfare has a really hideous impact upon civilians. And it's very difficult, it seems to me, to avoid it once warfare moves from controlled kind of management of insurgency operations, expeditionary, uh, expeditionary insurgency operations. Absolutely. So coming a bit to uh, the British military and how well it's structured for future urban operations, uh, we've got a question coming in regarding, first of all, how well do you think Western forces and the British military in particular are structured for uh, those sorts of operations? And how would you view the, so the, the results of, for example, the integrated review in light of the, uh, the operating environment you predict? Okay, well, th thanks for this. Uh, yeah, I was hoping someone wasn't going to ask this because I'm likely to make not very many friends in whichever way I answer this question. One is might likely to not make many friends. But anyway, so let me, I mean, if we had talking about the integrated group, let me focus on the UK. And then, so if you want to come back and ask me about wider forces, that's fine. Let me focus on the UK. So what do I think of British forces, British Army's capability in the urban? Um, I think it comes, I mean, they're, they're brilliant at beating themselves up about it and how incapable they are of it. Um, at um, company level, I mean, the British Army and, you know, British Army, British Land Forces, British Army Royal Marines have really good companies. Um, uh, they have excellent soldiers and Marines, normally pretty well equipped, very well equipped, uh, if a little bit lightly equipped at the moment, or at least their weaponry is slightly too on the light side. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're excellently organized, excellently trained. And so at the sort of company level, uh, British Army, Royal Marines, very good. The problem arises, especially in urban, not only, but especially in urban, is once you move up the scale. And once you move up scale to battalion, again, just about OK in comparative terms. But once you move up, start to move up to the brigade divisional level, uh, things start to open up, gaps start to open up, which, which would be very severely exploited uh, by an enemy. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, and the integrated review is absolutely directly uh, a problem here in terms of the, you know, the, my interpretation of the integrated review, and I'll say this just absolutely bluntly in this context, um, you know, the army lost the integrated review. The, arm, the integrated review was won by the Navy and the Air Force, and the, and the army paid, essentially has paid the bill uh, for aircraft carriers and F-35s. Now, that is fine. That is a strategic... Uh, decision. I, I I absolutely understand it, but but note it leaves the army um, in an in an exposed position. And where does it leave them exposed? Well, exactly where you need lots of resources in terms of urban fighting. So, namely, they haven't got enough tanks, so they'll be reduced to a hundred operational uh, tanks. Mm, so it's not really enough. Uh, artillery is a huge and worrying hole. Um, that uh, 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 the AS1, uh, AS90s are going out of service, the 105 gun is going out of service, but and will supposedly be re re uh, um, uh, brought back, if something else will be replaced, but there'll be a gap. Uh, warrior's gone, box has not gone in, so the mechanised, heavy mechanised manoeuvres gap. All of these things that are critical to fighting an intense urban fight, or even not that intense an urban fight, just an urban uh, operation of some level of intensity, um, they, they, they're gone. So uh, the army um, uh, is in at this point, I mean, it has aspirations, which I totally support, of trying to become a, uh, you know, a premier uh, uh, urban force. And I, I think it's totally plausible. Um, but there are some big gaps. I and mean, one of the ways to get over the gaps, as I keep um, saying to people, is You've got to think about the defence first in urban, and that is one way of starting to leverage one's capabilities as a land force. Um, and that's what I would suggest in the light of a not 
particularly optimal uh, integrated review, that's what I would suggest to uh, for the uh, for the British Army uh, to do. And indeed, it's what I would suggest for the Royal Marines to do as well. In fact, as a light as a light force. Absolutely. So we've got you know to pick up on a point you made in the book about the idea of fractal maneuver. We've got a, possibly an interrelated question about you know, all the other tenets of the future way of warfare, network, distributed, AI enabled, and all the rest. How do you think that interacts with the urban operating environment and that concept of fractal maneuver you lay out? Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Well, you know what I'm going to say here. I mean, yeah, it's, look, I, I in a, as a sociologist, you know, what you love to do is you love to connect things together. So wouldn't it be great is we've got this idea that society is postmodern and it's all liquid and, um, and, and fluid and flowing and all of the old boundaries and old realities of traditional contempt, you know, modern 20th century society, all those constrictions have gone and evaporated in a sort of magical digital swirl. It would be lovely. It would be, you know, as a sociologist, that would be lovely. It would prove your theory. Your theory would match the reality. Um, but it's just not, you know, you look at the evidence, it's just not there. I mean, so the idea that somehow um, the urban operation can match sort of postmodern digital liquid society and that militaries, what they need to be able to do is to manoeuvre seamlessly, mercurially through cities in little blobs, little sort of microbes that, that move autonomously. It, it, in my view, frankly, I mean, there are a couple of cases of it. But the, 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 the examples are very particular and generalizing from those very special case cases is, you know, it's, it's a case of making law, you know, making law from a, from a difficult case. Um, you know, it makes bad law. And, and that's what I'd say, that you, you look at the overwhelming character of the urban fight and it's not going to be resolved by some clever uh, maneuver on the ground and then this leads to the next question right if it's not going to be solved by fractal maneuver on the ground can it be solved by fractal maneuver in the digital space in the space of the internet in the virtual space of the internet um well what do i think about uh, the possibilities that um digital you know the digital uh, domain offer us I think I think they're really there. I think there's some really significant things that have happened, that are happening, that will happen. Namely, I think that any force, military force, that wants to be competitive in the next ten years is going to have to think seriously about artificial intelligence. Now, this does not mean, and I said it at the at the end of my talk. Not the idea that somehow there's going to be some supercomputer, super intelligent computer, taking us all over and doing a sort of you know, restage in the beginning, those wonderful opening credits of Terminator. That's not it. The key, I think, will be in terms of advancing the competitiveness of state forces, and I think it will be led by state forces, is to harness the potential that big data gives to militaries in terms of situational understanding, so that effectively you will try and imitate some of the strategies that Walmart, Google, or Amazon have tried to adopt, and in fact have successfully adopted, in a much more closed environment, in a market, a closed, uh, more uh, coherent, pristine market environment. Um, so I think that will be a critical thing. So you will harness the powers of AI, machine learning to, to, to data mine in, in, in the big data uh, environment in order to expedite your situational picture. Now, in absolute contrast to the, um, f f the Terminator vignette, what it's not going to be is about an improvement of the close battle. I actually don't think the close battle will be amenable to that kind of digitalized artificial intelligence mean lear machine learning approach where i think advances might be made is in the sort of deep battle space analyzing the situation the wider operational strategic situation probably uh, I, I mean certainly in the initial phase in that sort of phase zero phase one you know the gray zone as it's called that sort of hybrid odd space i mean i think this word liminal warfare has crept in obviously people have been reading their anthropology um uh, but th that's that that i think is a possibility but note 
it's a long way from the sort of words of informational maneuver and cognitive maneuver i mean i think you've got you know, there's a clear task that can be done and the issue will be how, how, how a military is going to actually frame that task and i don't think it's obvious at all i mean certainly i haven't got the expertise to know how to do it but i know there's some interesting work going on in that domain and that's where i think there will be advances in the next 10 years um and very interesting ones i think Absolutely. So just to take the conversation back to, you know, your opening proposition about the shrinking, the shrinking professional militaries, both Western and otherwise, it does seem these days that nobody goes to war without padding that military out with some, right? whether it's sheer militia or Ukrainian irregulars and perhaps in the future sort of expendable unmanned assets as well. What do you think the odds are of mass returning to the battlefield in the form of some form of auxiliary, be it a human or non-human? And, and what does that mean for the future of urban warfare? Do we see a kind of a return to fronts? Thanks. Yeah, I don't see any, I've got to say. Um, I mean, look, there's some, still some big militaries around the place. India. I mean, Israel is a big military, though actually it's much smaller than it was in, in relation to its population. Um, the PLA, uh, you know, the Chinese PLA is, is is a very large military, but much, much smaller than it used to be. Um, so I, I, I really don't see um, my, my own take on this. I really don't see a, a return to mass, certainly not for um, forces which have. Uh, moved out of that sort of massive 20th century structure. So, for instance, Western forces or Russia. Um, you know, there's there's some discussion. There have been some discussions in the military about you know reconstitution. That, given how small the militaries are, um, the armed forces, one of their missions is going to be reconstitute themselves. I, in a, my inference from this, is to literally go back to the 20th century and create some kind of mass citizen force. Um, uh, and so that you would you would start to generate armies of the size, well, not of the size that you had, but but sort of closing in on, you know, returning to some mm. large scale force. I, I I just don't see there's any evidence of that. And I don't see how it would work. And certainly there's some interesting instructive examples of this. So look at the Assad regime. They didn't mm. mobilize citizens to create a citizen army. Um, they they actually they effectively reduced their own force because most of it was untrustworthy. There was only elements of Shia and Alawite units, their special units that they trusted. And then they augmented them, Assad augmented them with Hezbollah and various other units from, you know, from the um, Iranian, uh, 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 the, you know, the IGRC, etc. So, I mean, it's, you know, for me, the idea that somehow we can turn history back and will remobilize citizenry, a totally diverse citizenry, ethnically, uh, racially diverse citizenry under a weak state to fight a war of the type of the 20th century. I've I got to say, I think the, the social and political geography, I just don't think is there for that. And I think, as you absolutely say, I think the almost certain, very likely to almost certain environment characteristic will be very small professional units will be attached to and augmented by local partnered proxy indigenous uh, forces and that that does create a very interesting um, dynamic in the theatre and, and for me obviously I would argue well that partnered element um, actually accentuates the slow siege-like characteristics um, for various reasons. One, that the militias are local, so normally they're worried about local issues, so the battle disperses into, into particular areas they're interested in. But also, very fact that you've got to spend most of your, quite a lot of time politically negotiating with those, those allies. You can't just organise, you know, order them to do things. It slows down the tempo of operations, and you, you can see the tempo of operations in Syria, Ukraine, you know, some of that partnered element slows things down very substantially. So, yeah, I mean, for me, I see absolutely, um, uh, you know, the warfare of the next five, 10 years to being a hybrid one in the sense that state forces will be augmented by or they will augment local irregular forces or regular forces 
to prosecute these campaigns. And I, I, in terms of um, machines, autonomous remote, yeah, I think they'll come in. They already have. I don't. I think they'll be less. They'll be less revolutionary than the realization that you can't fight a war today without your local allies, just as you couldn't in the early modern period um, or in the medieval period. That actually your local forces, irregular or regular they might be, are actually provide most of the most of the thing that you would call your army. It's not a homogenous, uniformed element anymore. It's not. I mean, that, that's actually quite a good word. It's not uniform. The forces are not uniform in every sense um and i think that would be that would be a real area I mean, scholars are already looking into that and i think some of their work's really excellent uh, and i would certainly advocate having a, people having a look at that quite carefully absolutely so to come to a more tactical question we have a que um, question that links to the subject of walls which of course featured very prominently in your book and i guess the uh, to summarize the question was how easy it is uh, how easy is it to fence in those micro citadels that combatants build within cities, cut them off from the rest of the city, isolate them and perhaps obliterate them over time? Um, well, this this obviously is a question that, uh, you know, fascinates me. And I enjoyed very much both my historical, you know, doing my little bit of historical work on fortifications. I mean, I really did enjoy it and on the contemporary usage. Um, what I would suggest is this, and, and this is the argument that I, I, I made in the book, is that I think that fortifications of various type, concrete two walls, Hesco Bastion, any, I mean, I mean, I'm not qualified to say, but I mean, I think my understanding is any any soldier, marine, or or any, any any personnel who deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, they couldn't move without some Hesco Bastion. So what I'd suggest is um, those kind of the use of walls, you know, this ancient technology. Um, will be has been and will be vital do i think that you could create a situation where you could actually seriously besiege in the technical sense of the term so in you know i use the word siege in a general sense as a kind of positional fight a slow positional fight but i actually as as it's used generally i include the ter the assault as well within that which is you know uh, the siege of troy is interesting because it finished not in a siege but in an attack um so so i mean I, I so so i use the word siege a little bit more generally but i mean the question of whether you could actually create a hermet you know hermetically seal people inside an area create a proper medieval siege it's an open question um I mean, it's been tried, you know, Sarajevo would be a, a, an example. There have been um, limited sieges. I mean, the, the, the Turks, in fact, have done a couple of limited sieges in northern Syria over the last few years in terms of clearing people out of areas and leveraging them. So I think limited, I think the chance of besieging a whole city in a technical sense, almost zero, um, because I think it's just too porous, too difficult to stop people. I think there's not enough troops and too, the cities are too big, the urban areas are too big. Um, the, but could you could you besiege a local area? It's possible. Could you you know create a wall of circumvallation and contravallation against uh, uh, an urban an urban stronghold of an opponent? It's possible, but I can't think of a, an absolute perfect example, a, a, a local one. But the other question I'd say, which battles like um, Sada City show, is: Do you need to? Um, that you might actually have elements, you know, limited elements of siege where you besiege, you know, you, you stop access to key elements in the city, to key routes in a city, and that, that does enough for you. It does enough for you to leverage an advantage. So, you know, in the Battle of Sada City, as we all know, um, the Americans didn't even begin to put a wall the whole way around Sada City, but they, they, they cut... The insurgent, the sheer insurgents, off from their key districts uh, in the Ishabilia and the, the, the Habibilia. So it, they didn't need to uh, to do that. So what I suggest is it's possible. Anything in history is possible. Um, so I, I'm not saying it'll never happen. I think that the 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 complexity of doing it prob possibly outweighs the advantages. And tactically. What I would take from previous urban battles is it may not be necessary to create a, a pristine siege of a kind of Richard the Lionheart type or indeed of a Roman type 
um, that you'd seen in the past, um, that that may actually not be necessary to create the create the uh, results that you want. And just on the theme of, you know, results that are good enough in some ways, a uh, final question, if I may, with, with, you know, going back to Sadr City and, and Baghdad, the Americans are effectively having to, well, come to live in some ways with the Sadrists as a, as a fact of life, sort of an, a modus vivendi. What, uh, assuming you can't control the whole city all the time, what does good enough look like? What bits of the city do you have to control? What, what does winning in this uh, urban environment look like? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it, it, it comp- that it's a great question, and it, it absolutely depends what you mean. It, you know, it depends what you think your political goals are. I mean, you know, if you look, one of the interesting things about looking at urban areas, you know, in the 21st century, late 20th and into the 20th, 21st century, is, you know, really significant areas of urban terrain have been ceded by states who never in the past would have ceded them to either just the general population, so they're just not governed, or actually to non-government elements. And typically, the most usual, of course, is criminal elements. So you've got very significant areas of, uh, you know, very very significant urban areas um, in the global south. I mean, obviously, Brazil, Mexico, you know, Sao Sao Paulo, uh, Rio de Janeiro, um, Mexico City would be really obvious examples where large swathes of the terrain is ceded de facto to criminal gangs. But I mean, e- e- even in the in the north, I mean, there's large areas of cities that, you know, they're not really that well administered by police forces. They're not well looked after. Um, so, so you know, at a certain level, cities can function with an extraordinary level of non-governmental control. I mean, Rio is is a you know, I mean, you know, it, it, I mean, it is a fun, you know, it is a functioning city. It's a very successful city in certain ways. So it would depend, it would absolutely depend on the political judgment of what what was regarded as as plausible. I mean, there's certain, there would be certain t- certain things, certain times when uh, no no government could accept the the um, secession of certain areas of certain functions. I mean, that's effectively what happened at the start of the Syrian civil war. And there's periodically the Brazilian states decide it really can't put up with Commander Vermelha, um, you know, doing certain operations and dealing drugs or 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 or, 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 or you know killing policemen. Can't it can't it can't countenance it. So it, you know it's 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 a great way of ending because what this shows is look. Um, you know, urban areas are political, are just intensely political places. And there's a massive spectrum from pretty benign state control, state uncontrol to absolute full out high intensity warfare and everything in between. And when we think about urban operations, you know, we'll have to we'll have to go to one end or the other or in the middle. I, I in that book, I certainly went to the high intensity end. But note the extraordinary diversity of spectrum we're talking about. And to talk sensibly, we have to think about that spectrum. But also every time we say something, we just have to recognize, right, which bit of the spectrum are we talking about? Because the political diversity and therefore what military forces, what security forces are trying to do in operations is also almost infinitely diverse. Well, I mean, that's a fascinating point on which to end. I mean, I could go on for another hour. This is a really fascinating topic and very erudently presented, I might add, but uh, mindful of the time. Uh, Anthony, thank you very much for making the time to deliver a really fascinating, uh, a really excellent brief to us today. And uh, thank you to everyone in attendance as well. Uh, I, I thank And for your questions, I, I do hope to see you at future adversarial uh, study sessions. and. With that, uh, a digital round of applause for our speaker. Thanks. Thanks so much. It was lovely to speak to you, Sid, and, and thanks for everything. Really, really lovely to talk. Thank you. Likewise. Take care.